Welcome back to this third segment in the law sessions of land law relating to co-ownership and in particular trust as it relates to the matrimonial home specifically. Now in the previous segment, we certainly looked at uh, various options in relation to the resulting trust and what is required there. What we will look at now is the constructive trust scenario and see what is required in order to show that there is a constructive trust. Well, historically, yeah, you had to prove either an express agreement constructive trust, which required that there was an express agreement regarding the beneficial interest. That was what the express agreement was about. And the cases, of course, are various. Petit, Grant and Edwards, Ease and Ease, uh, Hammond and Mitchell, all these cases are at the very least worth a look. Oxlen Iskak as well. Then you also needed detrimental reliance. Again, the same cases would apply. And then, of course, you must show that the express agreement had not been honored. And then it would be the court's task to consider the quantification of the shares in an express agreement, constructive trust, cases, of course, redemption, Eves and Oxley. What I would urge you to do is at least know what the facts of these cases are, know what was found in the case on the basis, and look at the examiner's approach at times. Because quite often, the examiner will give you a fact pattern based on these cases when they set out the problem questions. So, for example, they may, may give you a Grant and Edwards situation where they say to you, well, the um, Mrs. X decided to move in with Mr. Y because Mrs. X was still married and she didn't want her name on the title simply because she didn't want the, uh, uh, pre uh, pre uh, the husband, whom she hasn't divorced yet, to then have uh, any access to the property she's buying. So you need to sometimes watch what the facts of the cases are because they may tend to find themselves on an exam question. Separate from an express agreement constructive trust, you may have an implied agreement constructive trust where there is an implied agreement regarding the beneficial interest which is inferred from the conduct of the parties. And similarly, again, you have a detrimental reliance and the implied agreement has not been honored. And the court's task, again, of course, is to quantify the shares. Even if a party can claim an interest under resulting trust, as I said earlier, it does not exclude the possibility of claiming an interest under a constructive trust as an alternative. This tends to be advantageous as a share under constructive trust tends to be greater as explained in the previous segment. Because again, if X puts in 20% and Y 80, but there was an agreement for a 50% split, then that 50% split would be approached from the basis of a constructive trust. It tends to give a greater share based on the party's intention as opposed to contribution as on the resulting trust. Now, the basis of a constructive trust is either, as I said, an express or implied agreement between the parties that the person not on the legal title is to have an interest in the property. The person not on the legal title acts to his or her detriment in reliance on the agreement, but this is then denied. The courts construct a trust based on the agreement, the reliance and the subsequent denial, and the agreement does not have to meet Section 53.1 of the LPA requirements because Section 52 specifically provides for the absence of writing in the context of resulting and constructive trust. Now, the express agreement can include a promise or an understanding. And I would urge you to look at the Hammond and Mitchell case, which had to do with a bunny girl in that case. It does make interesting reading and it shows you sometimes when persons go into an agreement uh, on somewhat arguably tenuous basis and the fact that they may very well be held to it. There must of course be detrimental reliance. 
because equity does not necessarily assist a volunteer, i.e. somebody who has given nothing. And then you see if the express agreement is not honored. Now, the quantification of the shares in an express agreement constructive trust, the courts will try and give effect to the actual oral agreement. So if, for example, you're promised an equal share, the court will award 50%. Look at redemption for this in 1975. Uh, the wife had put one ninth of the purchase price. So one ninth uh, was what she got in a resulting trust, but she was what she would have gotten in a resulting trust, but she was promised 50% by the husband in an express oral agreement. Sometimes though, the court takes a broad brush approach and this is what the courts did, well, Lord Denning anyway, in Eves and Eves in 1975. And the court there gave a 25% as they felt that a 50% share was too much. If you remember in that case, he told her, he told Rose that he didn't put her name on the title because of her age. And the court said, of course, that suggests that there was some kind of uh, agreement there. Now in Midland Bank and Cook, in 1995, the implied agreement constructive trust here was that by way of a wedding present of a thousand pounds to the husband and wife towards their house, which the purchase price was eight and a half thousand, well, under resulting trust, the wife's share would have come out at somewhere in the order of about uh, just under seven percent, giving her approximately five hundred and fifty pounds. But the court of appeals said that she had contributed to the purchase price, and this was conduct which could be found uh, 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 on the basis that there was an implied agreement, constructive trust. Now, in approaching any question on constructive trust, be mindful of whether there is one legal owner or two legal owners. So, whether or not there is one person's name on the title or whether there uh, is in fact two persons name names on the title then you need to see if there is a declaration as to the party's beneficial interest if it is then it is conclusive you don't need to discuss it and as i said earlier in the previous segment this might actually point to a severance question the two important cases in this area uh, will of course be a main focus in this particular lecture and will form the majority of the discussion as we proceed. The cases, of course, are Oxley and Hiscock and Stack and Dowden. Now, in Oxley and, in Oxley and Hiscock, the family home was purchased in the name of one co-owner and in Stack, it was purchased in both parties' name. The significance of both cases is that there was no express declaration as to the beneficial interests of the parties. And that is why these cases become important. Because as I said, if you see an express declaration, that is conclusive as to the party's beneficial interest. If the parties say nothing as to their beneficial interests, then the significance of Oxley and Hiscock and Stack and Dowden cannot be underestimated. So, for example, when you consider how the court or how the cases have been looked at, broadly speaking, in the past, the courts have tried two approaches. First, they have tried applying the traditional principles of the resulting trust. But clearly, this is going to be difficult because you would need to look at or start from what the parties have contributed. The second approach was a much broader one. It is sometimes called the common intention approach. What common intention as to the quantum of shares can be inferred from all the circumstances of the joint tenancy in regards to the two parties in the relationship. Now, Lord Justice Waite in Midland Bank and Cook said when the court is proceeding in cases like the present, where the partner without legal title has successfully asserted an equitable interest through direct contribution to determine in the absence of express evidence of intention 
what proportion the parties must have intended for their beneficial ownership, the duty of the judge is to undertake a survey of the whole course of dealings between the parties relevant to their ownership and occupation of the property. Now you can see that this whole idea of the whole court of dealings is not necessarily new when you look at, for example, Stack and Dowden. It just seems to take on a more emphasized role in those particular cases. Now on the back of that kind of approach, let's focus on the cases of Oxley and Hiscock, which involved, as I said earlier, one legal owner, and the case of Stack and Dowden, which involved two legal owners. But in both cases, what they have in common is that there was no express declaration as to the equitable interest. So let's look at the facts of Oxley, first of all. Oxley was a typical case in which you had an unmarried couple, Mr. Hiscock and Mrs. Oxley. They lived in a house, and the house in issue was where they lived as husband and wife with her children by a previous marriage. They had met in 1985 when Mrs. Oxley was the secure tenant of a council house. Now in 1986, she exercised her statutory right to buy the freehold for 25,000 pounds. But in fact, the whole of the purchase price was provided by Mr. Iscock. Now, I would urge you that whenever you consider any kind of fact pattern or problem, you should always consider it logically and see what the legal position is at each stage and the consequence of that. Because the position in relation to the house was quite clear. The legal and equitable title belonged to Mrs. Oxley. The intention behind the £25,000 provided by Mr. Hiscock was undoubtedly alone because at the very least this can be seen by the fact that he was given a legal charge on the house to secure it. By 1991, the couple bought a property at 35 Dickens Close and they paid £127,000 for it. It was the division of the proceeds of the sale of this house when they broke up that was in issue. The price was found partly from a building society mortgage loan of £30,000, partly from the proceeds of the sale of the council house by Mrs. Oxley, and the rest of the money from Mr. Hiscock's own savings. Now, here's an interesting point, and this is where, of course, lawyers will make their money and where you, as budding lawyers, need to make sure you make your notes properly. Just by way of passing, the solicitor for uh, Mrs. Oxley repeatedly warned her at the time that she, that she should either have the purchase put in their joint names or at the very least have a declaration of the trustees setting out their interests. But her response, along the lines of love conquers all, said, well, I am quite satisfied with the present arrangement and I feel I know Mr. Hiscock well enough not to need written legal protection in this matter. Well, she clearly didn't know him well enough because the legal title was in fact put in his name and she didn't listen to the solicitor, which then means more work for the lawyers. Apparently, with a view to preventing any claim against the property by her former husband. Now remember I said this was, of course, a property that um, based on the right to buy and then subsequently she's had the funds to do that. She says, I know him well enough, everything will be fine. Now Lord Justice Chadwick did hold in that case that Mrs. Oxley was entitled to a 40% share based on the facts and it was not equal in light of the difference between the initial cash contributions. I will also flag up the Stack and Dowden facts. Now in Stack and Dowden, again, almost like a mirror image of the case of Oxley. But this time, there was a bit of a gender reversal here. In Stack and Dowden, Mr. Stack and Miss Dowden purchased a property in 1993. 
it was conveyed and registered in the joint names. Now, the parties were unmarried, but they had been in a relationship for 18 years when they had purchased the property. They had four children. The parties did not execute a formal declaration of trust. The transfer deed did, however, contain a declaration that the survivor would be entitled to give a valid receipt for capital money arising from the disp disposition of all or part of the property. Both parties contributed to the purchase price of the property. Mrs. Dowden, 65% of the purchase price from funds in a building society account in her sole name. However, Mr. Stack had arguably contributed part of those funds. The balance was provided by an interest-only loan secured by a mortgage in the party's joint name. Joint names, rather. Now, Mr. Stack paid the mortgage interest and the premiums due under the policy in the joint names. Ms. Dowden paid the premiums due under the endowment policy in her sole name. The mortgage was discharged over the years by a series of lump sum payment and Ms. Dowden provided just under 60% of the capital and Mr. Stack approximately 40%. Now, while they lived together, the parties kept separate bank accounts and they made a, made a series of separate investments and savings. The parties separated in 2002 and of course, the point before the court was whether or not on the party's separation, the amount being sought by the one party, Mr. Stack in this particular case, whether the court should find for what he was asking. Mr. Stack was saying that he was entitled to 50%, not least because he said, why are we even discussing this? This is not a Oxley and Hiscock type case. He said, my name is as a joint legal owner. So, when you look at the presumption at law, the law says that where you have joint legal owners, then equity will follow the law. So if he's a joint legal owner at law, does that make him a joint equitable owner and therefore a 50% share? Well, unfortunately, the court's uh, position was not to be so generous and they said yes. Even though the starting point is that equity will follow the law, it is a presumption which can be rebutted. And on the facts, they felt that Mrs. Stoughton had rebut rebutted it. And as such, they uh, uh, found that the parties got shares of 65% to Mrs. Stoughton and of course 35% to Mr. Stark. But the point they made was that Mrs. Stoughton limited herself. And had she asked for more, there was the possibility there. We're going to break for a moment. We will come back and we will discuss in the final segment the implications of these two cases on the current uh, co-ownership situation on trust. <laughs> 